Who is Jesus? The answer to that question largely depends upon who you ask. There are some that would say that Jesus is a myth, that he was made up by the Jews or made up by Christians, that he's not a real figure, he's not a real person, just an imaginary teacher and leader. There are others that would identify him, that He was a Jewish reformer or somehow a Messiah that came to set the Jews free from the bondage they were experiencing under the Roman Empire, maybe lead them in some type of reformation. There are others that would identify Jesus as only a do-gooder, some man who came and did miracles and fed people, taught good morals, gave a different way of living that would improve man's lives. There are some that would answer that question by saying that Jesus is only the founder of Christianity, putting him on the same level of all the other leaders and founders of the world's religion. And then there are those that would identify him as Savior and King. So who is Jesus. Since no one lived on the earth at the time that Jesus was here, the answer is not found in our opinions or in our ideas, but it is found in the written Word of God. See, the Bible declares who Jesus is. The Bible is all about Jesus Christ, who He is and what He did and His character and His plans and His desires for our life. But if you reject the Bible or choose to interpret it in your own way, then you will never really know who Jesus is or what he has done for you. See, there are many today that believe in a fictitious Jesus, a Jesus of their imagination, a Jesus of their own making in their mind. And there are many others today that will teach and preach Jesus, but it is also an imaginary Jesus, a fake Jesus that has been created by religion or by man's opinion or somehow in man's thought. They've designed a Jesus to fit their own way of thinking. And sadly, many today really don't have a proper understanding of who Jesus is. So what does the Bible say about Jesus? We're not interested in what religion teaches or what a preacher says, because if we're to put faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It is the Word of God that illuminates Jesus. It is the Word of God that teaches us about who He was and what He did and what He thinks and what He desires. And I believe the Bible is a very convincing book. It is a book, yes, of facts and figures and details, but it is also a supernatural book. As the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 12, that the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword that it is spiritual in its nature, meaning that it speaks to the soul and the spirit of a man. It's not just a book of history. It's not just a book of information. But it is a living book that proclaims a living Savior, a living God. And that person that it magnifies and it glorifies and speaks about is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why I said the Bible is all about Jesus. From the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation, he is seen in every book, he's seen in every chapter, he is illustrated through many different examples, he is seen in many different images, he is proclaimed very clearly in the Gospels by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as they detail who Jesus was and what he did while here on this earth. The Bible is all about Jesus. And so for the next few minutes, allow me the opportunity to share with you from the Word of God, the Bible, 
five truths about Jesus. Now, you may already know these truths. And if that's the case, then I hope that they will encourage you today. But maybe some of these truths will shock you, saying, well, I didn't know that about Jesus, or I'd never heard that before. Well, whatever the case is, my prayer is that these truths about the Lord Jesus Christ will convince you to believe in him, put your faith in him and your absolute trust in what he did for you, and have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think as I bring out these truths, you'll understand why I talk about a relationship with Jesus. It's not just a head knowledge about him. It's not just a matter of, well, I know this detail about him, or I accept that he did live and do these things. But really the desire and the overwhelming, I guess, goal of the word of God is to bring you into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's talk about these truths that the Bible highlights. These five wonderful truths that talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. The first truth that I want to bring to your attention is this. The Bible teaches that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Now, I realize that many religions today do not teach that Jesus is God. There are some that will teach that he is a man sent from God. They will identify that. He obviously had a message that they would say was of God. He did the work of God, but he was just a man. That's all he was. He was a man of God, but he was not God in the flesh. Others would go on and say that he was a prophet of God, putting him on the same level as Old Testament prophets like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the many others, or even that of like the apostles. He prophesied the message of God. He foretold of things to come, that he was a prophet of God, but not God in the flesh. I've even heard religions teach that he was a son of God going to this extreme, saying that he was a son of God and the brother of Satan. He was the good son, whereas Satan was the disobedient son. That he was of God, but not God in his entirety. But the Bible is very clear on this matter. It teaches that Jesus is God. Listen to what the Gospel of John begins with. In John chapter number 1 and verse number 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then if you jump down to verse number 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Very clear connection there. It says that the Word became flesh. But the Word was God. Then if you jump to 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 16, listen to what is declared in this verse. It says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Meaning this is something that is difficult to understand, something that is beyond our comprehension. What is that mystery that has been declared? It says, God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The Bible does not leave this matter up for debate or even doubt. It clearly declares that Jesus is God. Note what that verse said. God was manifest or God was revealed in the flesh, human flesh. And it goes through and it tells us other things that magnify and give evidence to the fact that Jesus was not just a prophet of God or a man sent from God or a do-gooder or, or the founder of Christianity. Notice what it says. He was justified of the Spirit. He declared himself to be God through his miracles, through what he did. Think of all that Jesus did. He gave sight to the blind. He raised those that were lame. He raised the dead. He turned 
fish and bread and multiplied it. He did miracle after miracle, and all of these things gave sign to, to the power of God. And when he did these miracles, he never said, well, this is something that was given to me temporarily, or this is something that God allowed me to do. He said, I do these miracles because I am God. The Bible says he was seen of angels. Whenever the angels were around him, they magnified him and glorified him. On the day of his birth into this world, the angels sang hallelujah and glory to God in the highest. They were magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ because they recognized that he was their creator. He was God. He was preached to the world as God in the flesh. The gospel declares that, that he is God and that he is our creator and he is our savior. And then he was received up to glory. And Jesus said that I go and I sit upon the throne of God, that the world is my footstool. Everything in the word of God proclaims that Jesus is God. Not one time is there doubt left that Jesus could have just been a good man, a godly man, a, a man sent from God. It always declares that he is God. If you study the word of God, you'll see that Jesus is the everlasting, eternal God. He is creator of all things. He is the wise, all-knowing, all-powerful King of kings and Lord of lords. That is what the word of God declares him to be. But the second truth is this. Jesus was born of a virgin. Now this truth can seem impossible to comprehend. How can a woman get pregnant without being with a man? Now, in fact, this is a question that Mary asked when she was informed that she was pregnant uh, uh, and had conceived the Lord Jesus Christ. She asked the angel who had informed her. She goes, how can this be? This is impossible. I have never been with a man. She was a virgin. And I love the answer of the angel. He said this, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. And when you read the scriptures, you'll come to understand that Jesus was born of a virgin. He was supernaturally conceived by the work of the Holy Spirit of God. There was no human involvement. The Bible clearly states in Luke chapter number 1 and verse number 35 that he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. In Matthew chapter number 1, the Holy Spirit makes it clear that Mary had not been with Joseph. They were engaged. They were planning on getting married, but they kept themselves pure. They had not been together in an intimate way. So there was no human involvement that uh, was a part of this process. It was all a work of God. It was a supernatural, miraculous work that was done of the Holy Spirit of God. Now you may ask, well, why was Jesus born of a virgin? Why did he have to come of a virgin? Why could it not have been of Joseph and Mary coming together and God saying, well, through the conception of Joseph's seed there, I'm going to turn that child into the Son of God. I'm going to do a miracle in that in that process right there. Why did Jesus have to be born of a virgin? Why was Jesus had to have been born or conceived of the Holy Ghost? Well, here's something very important. For Jesus to accomplish his mission on earth, number one, he needed to take on human flesh. The Bible's very clear on that, that for him to die on the cross, for him to identify with man, he had to be human. He had to have that human flesh. But for Jesus to maintain his deity, and that means for Jesus to be God, he could not be created by human flesh. The Bible gives an answer to this. It's been found in Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 12. Listen as I read this verse to you. Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, 
And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now note what that verse is telling us. That because of Adam's sin, remember Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, and in that disobedience, they became sinners. God put a curse upon all human flesh. And he said, because you have sinned against me, all generations to follow you will also be born with a sin nature. And from the days of Adam and Eve, every person that has been conceived, every person that has been born into this world has been born with a sin nature. But Jesus, Jesus was not born a sinner. Jesus was not conceived in sin. The Bible is very clear that he was without sin. In him was no sin at all. That he had the attribute in the flesh, the deity and the attribute of Almighty God. He was pure. He was holy. He was righteous. He was perfect in every way. And so as we look at the virgin birth, what we find is that Mary gave Jesus his humanity, that through the birth of a woman, he took on human flesh, but the miracle of the conception of the Holy Ghost maintained his deity. Some have described Jesus as the God-man, perfect God, but also perfect man that there was a merging of those two, that God took on human flesh. But what God did not take on is the human nature. See, the human nature is sinful. The human nature is disobedient. The human nature is rebellious against the laws and the commands of God. But yet Jesus came into this world, yes, in human flesh, but all God embodying that flesh. Quite a marvelous miracle that God did. So the Bible declares that Jesus is God. It declares that when he came into this world, he was born of supernatural means, that a virgin brought him into this world. But then thirdly, Jesus died on the cross for you. He died on the cross. Now, a lot of people know this story. When they think of Jesus, they think about his crucifixion, his brutal death on the cross. But what I want you to understand is this. Jesus did not die as a martyr. He did not die as a criminal. He did not die as a victim. It wasn't the mobs that overtook him and said, I, we're going to crucify you because we hate you or we disagree with you. In fact, the Bible says or Jesus himself said this, that I lay my life down. No man takes it from me. He was God in the flesh. He could have called 10,000 angels and said, stop this. He could have spoke a word and, and defeated the plans of evil man. But he allowed it. He allowed himself to be laid down and be sacrificed for you. Now, we've already noted that Jesus was without sin. Perfect man. Perfect God. He did no sin. He never lied. He never stole. He never used a curse word. He never committed adultery. There was nothing that Jesus did that was wrong. And so that means there is no reason for him to die. The Bible is very clear. He knew no sin. He was without sin. He was holy. He was blameless. So why did Jesus die on the cross? Well, it comes down to that. He died for you. He died for me. In Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 8, the Bible says this, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You were the reason he came to this earth. You were the reason he died a very brutal death upon the cross. And that verse of Scripture tells you all the things that you need to know. Number one, it's because He loves you. God commendeth His love toward us. He showed His love to you and I. How did He show that? He didn't show it by writing it in the clouds. I love you. 
He, he didn't show it by sending a bird to sing it to us every morning. He showed it by coming to this earth, laying down his life on the cross, dying for our sin, and showing us that he loves us to that extreme, that he would pay our debt. See, my friend, it was your sin, it was my sin, that nailed Jesus to the cross of Calvary. It's all about our sin. And when you study the Word of God, you'll see this, that sin always has a penalty. Romans chapter number 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin, the penalty for sin is death. There is no way around it. You can't give money. You can't work off your debt. The only thing that is demanded as a penalty for sin is death. And sin has to be paid for. Again, God does not overlook sin. He tells us that all of us will be judged. All of us will stand before God and our lives will be judged. And he will righteously judge the right and the wrong. And yet the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus paid for our sin on the cross. He laid down his life. He shed his blood. He endured the suffering on the cross. Why? Because that was what the law demanded. That is what sin's penalty was. And he paid it in full. In fact, he made seven statements from the cross. And his final statement was this. It is is finished. He wasn't talking about the, the sacrifice or the suffering. It wasn't just a statement of this that I'm about to die. He said all that the law demanded, all the payment of sin has been paid for. It is finished. Sin has been completely paid for. And now man can receive that gift of salvation. See, Jesus died for all of our sin. In John 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that He died for all of us. He paid for all of our sin, the most wicked and vile sins that we've committed, the most minor and insignificant sins in our mind, He paid for. Every sin must be judged. And it was judged on the cross of Calvary for you and I. But then we come to the next truth, and that is not only did Jesus die on the cross for us, but he rose from the dead for us. Romans chapter number 4 and verse 24 says that he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. He went to the cross. Why? Because we offended God. We disobeyed God's holy law. We were rebellious against God. We were sinful in the deeds that we did and in our thoughts. But he was delivered there. Why? To pay for our sin. But then he rose again to offer us salvation. A dead Savior can't do anything for us. A person who is dead has no power, has no life, has no ability. And if Jesus, if all he did was die, he could never save us. We would never know that salvation was complete, that our sin was paid for. But three days after he died, he rose from the grave victoriously and he declared to the world, sin has been paid for and now I am alive to give you that gift of salvation. The resurrection is very important. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you cannot be a recipient of the salvation that Jesus offers you. Because the Bible says that we must believe that he died and rose again. And if you go through the order of events, the Bible very clearly tells us that Jesus died. He died on that Wednesday morning, put on the cross at 9 a.m. He took his final breath at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. He was buried by 6 p.m. And then three days and three nights he was in the tomb. This Good Friday teaching does not fit the timeline of Scripture. Jesus died on the Wednesday, was in the grave Thursday, Friday, and all day Saturday. And then that Sunday morning, very early in the morning, those women came 
to anoint the body of Jesus, but what they found is the stone rolled away. They walked into that tomb and they found the burial clothes folded neatly and laying there, but there was no body. And they met those angels outside and they said, why have you come? He said that he would rise from the dead. He is not here, but he is risen. And yes, they were fearful, and yes, they were amazed, but eventually they started to rejoice. Jesus rose again. And for the next 40 days, Jesus showed himself to well over 500 people, and he declared himself, I am not dead, but I am alive. That is a wonderful truth of Jesus Christ. He is a living Savior. Out of all the religions in the world, he is the only one that has died and risen from the dead. He is the only one that laid down his life for his people and then rose again to give them eternal life and then to have a living relationship with them. He's the only one. And here's the fifth truth. And that is one day Jesus will return again. He said to his followers in John chapter number 14, as he spoke about his death and his suffering. And they were troubled over this and they were concerned. But yet he said this in John 14 verse 3, I will come again. I will go away, but don't be despairing. Don't get overwhelmed. I will return. And the return of Jesus Christ, when you study the scriptures, you see it is in two parts. First of all, he will return in the clouds for true believers. And the reason he will return in the clouds, and we often refer to this as the rapture, the catching away, in the twinkling of an eye, those who have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will disappear just like that. And they will be in the clouds with the Lord. And why does he come again in the clouds? It is to deliver them from the wrath to come. Because once that happens, the Bible speaks about a terrible time on this earth known as the Great Tribulation. Or if you read it in the book of Daniel, it's referred to as Daniel's 70th week. Where God pours out His fury. Where God pours out His judgment upon mankind. And the wonderful thing is this, that if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you obtain salvation. You are not appointed to wrath. But Jesus delivers you because you allowed him to pay for your sin and to redeem you. There is coming a day where Jesus will step out on the clouds. The trump of God shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds. But it doesn't end there. Jesus also will return to earth one day. He will step foot on the Mount of Olives. The armies of the Antichrist will be there in that valley. And he will speak a word and he will defeat Satan. He will defeat the armies of the Antichrist. And from that moment on, he will set up his millennial kingdom. And the word millennial means a thousand. And for a thousand years, Jesus will rule and reign here on this earth. And the Bible speaks about that in Revelation chapter number 19. Of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords coming back and making all things new. That's the truth of Jesus. I love how the Apostle John ended his book. In John 21 and verse 25, he says, There are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So much about Jesus. But let me ask you this as we conclude. What do you think about Jesus? Do you believe that he's God? Do you accept that he's a creator? Do you acknowledge that he is the Savior who died for your sin, was buried and rose again? And have you believed in him as your only hope? These are the truths about Jesus.